So um, I'm delighted to have uh, um, Craig, an old man in here, to, to talk with us. I don't think we need too much introduction of Craig because uh, he was with us for a while. So uh, Craig is Director of Engineering at New York, Google, and he's here to give us a talk on finding information. So Great. with that, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Is the mic uh, going to ring? Let's uh, switch the actual slides. Um, so today I want to, I'm going to give a you know, reasonably high level talk about Google, uh, about some of our technology, and, and concentrate on a few things. Reliability is <coughs> better. You know, how we make a reliable service that uh, has a very high uptime, especially with, since we use cheap, unreliable hardware. And how we do that to scale, how we design that architect that to make sure we can scale uh, with, with you know, large factors. Uh, secondly, talk a little bit about routes, because uh, when people search on the web, they don't just want the service to be available, they want to get have their top 10 uh, results for a query uh, be, you know, be what they're looking for. So I'll talk a little bit about the ranking algorithm. And I'll talk about some sort of newer ideas that are uh, slightly away from standard web search, um, things based on labs and uh, Google and also other services like local search and news and Google. And finally, I'm going to uh, talk about some uh, um, the interesting statistical tidbits that uh, Google observes from having a large pool of work. So that will be a sort of a lighter end, note to end on. Um, but first I wanted to uh, mention Google's mission. And mission statements you know, can often be kind of dry and pride, but I actually quite like Google's. It's to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So in some sense, this is quite broad because there's a lot of information in the world. So we're not just focusing on web information, we're also focusing on information from other sources, so uh, uh, Google Groups, which, uh, such as News, Usenet as an example, and uh, uh, there are other services like Local Search, which relies on some uh, Yellow Pages data, and also offline data, for example, Google Catalog, which scans uh, uh, pages catalog. Uh, so there's all kinds of different information that we eventually want to search over. Um, so in some sense it's quite broad, but it's also narrow enough to keep us focused. Um, even uh, we just announced Gmail, kind of a, 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 an April Fool's-like press release, and uh, Gmail is centered around searching. Um, search as an interface to email, instead of uh, spending a lot of time filing, just make sure you can find your email when you, uh, when you need to find <coughs> what's been sent to you previously. So search keeps us focused on, on uh, uh, a constrained enough area that we don't get too carried away. So first, reliability of scale. Uh, over time, Google scaled uh, in terms of the number of users, the number of pages, the number of queries per second, uh, very, very quickly. And we've had to cope with big changes in the number of queries per day. Uh, a couple of classic examples years ago when we started serving queries for Yahoo, and before that for Netscape, uh, overnight, query traffic went up by uh, a factor of three or four. And we, it, was, it was necessary to construct an architecture where we could essentially throw more machines into a pool and had extra capacity. Um, similarly, if you look around the world at, at where Google is used, this is, a, this is a sort of a slightly synthetic image of uh, where power is in the world, where light, net, uh, where electric light is in the world. And if we, if we overlay on that, uh, places where Google queries come from. We see that Google is pretty international, essentially, where there's electricity, where there's the internet, people are querying Google. So we have over 4 billion web documents. Actually, I should have updated the slide. We have over 6 billion web documents. Um, 4 billion of those are from the web. Um, and then many of other non-HTML documents from the web, things like PDF, PostScript, um, Microsoft Word and Excel, we convert the text and index. And then we also have, uh, I really, really should have updated the slide, we have about 900 million images. Uh, Usenet, 700 million individual messages, and 35,000 news groups, and well over 20 terabytes of data for just one copy of all of this information. Uh, we serve over 20, 200 million queries a day and uh, tens of thousands of servers. We have a lot of disk at Google. So things operate on an extremely large scale. And that raises some interesting opportunities, but also some challenges. So one of, one of the things that's certified Google right from the beginning, the Google technology, is um, the fact that we use commodity PC hardware. So all of you know that there's kind of a sweet spot in, in PC hardware in terms of processors and disk and memory where um, 
you know, the very latest processes are quite expensive, um, and but then uh, sort of two thirds of the performance is a is a great price performance point, and we tend to try and be there, but uh, from a from a processor point of view, but also from a disk point of view, again, you know, um, 100 gigabyte disk is or, or 200 gigabyte disk is not a bad trade off um, in terms of uh, capacity and dollars per megabyte. So we concentrate on buying equipment that's sort of in this commodity sweet spot. And we also don't want to spend a lot of money on equipment. So we buy sort of no-name hardware. Um, we buy no-name memory. In fact, the memory doesn't, doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, the manufacturer's label stamped on the chips because uh, it's not certified for use in consumer PCs or business PCs. Uh, this is memory that is itself pretty unreliable. Um, we get it on big rolls. And we, we don't actually have, have, have it in SIMS initially. We get it on big rolls, and uh, we, we actually manufacture those on the SIMS and, and uh, buy in bulk that way. Um, so the memory is unreliable. Um, the, the disks that we buy are consumer disks. And, uh, and if you use your PC a few hours a day at home, uh, you know, those disks are not doing a lot of seeking and not doing a lot of accesses. At Google, they're being used 24, hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and also in very hot environments. These PCs are stacked very, very close together, so they're harder than they should be. So the disks also fail relatively frequently. So, you know, I'm painting this sort of disastrous portrait of hardware at Google. So given that, and given this, all this stuff is very cheap, how do we uh, run a service that's reliable? So uh, just to give you an idea, if one Google day is about 40 machine years, in terms of the number of machines that we have simultaneously, and if a machine dies twice a year, then we, we have about 82 machines die every day. And again, these are out of date. So imagine sort of hundreds of machines sort of keeling over at a moment's notice. Uh, how, do you, how do you continue to operate? Uh, so, so lesson number one is redundancy. Uh, um, redundancy at all levels of our system, and designing the system from the ground up to handle failure. So we don't have a system that assumes uh, a very reliable mainframe. We have a system that assumes we're going to distribute across many, many unreliable machines. And so right from the bottoms of the operating systems that we use, uh, we, we do our software assuming that things will fail. So the basic principle is to replicate everything. Um, so if I'm the Google web server, which we call GWIS, there are very lot, lots of creative names for the Google. So the Google web server uh, talks to, to many different backends. And for any of those backends that it talks to, there's always another equivalent one it could talk to instead if it decides that, that machine has gone down. So if you're, if you're a web server, you're constantly pinging your backend, either querying them or checking on their health. And if, you, if the sort of half a second goes by when that machine doesn't respond, you give up and fail over to another machine. Um, so, and this happens throughout the system. So, you know, there are many layers of servers that talk to other backends, and they have a similar policy of failing over very quickly. So, single or multiple failures don't fail. They don't bring the system down. They reduce capacity, though. So, eventually, you, you, you do need to replace those machines. And in the meantime, you have reduced capacity. So, you have to design for a little bit more than you absolutely need. Um, the nice thing about this is, so you've got all this replication for redundancy, so you might think that would multiply our costs by you know, some large factor. Well, in fact, you need this replication anyway for, for scalability, for uh, supplying uh, throughput for many, many users. Because we're using the same web index for uh, millions of users worldwide, uh, we, we use the extra machines for redundancy and for scalability. Uh, so essentially, it's not wasted. Uh, except for the small additional amount we need as a buffer. Um, so one nice thing about uh, serving an index, and especially an index on something like the web, is most of the web uh, doesn't change from day to day. Some of it does, and we have a special index for that. But in general, uh, the index is read-only. We crawl the web, we index it, we push it out to the servers, we update it periodically. Um, but apart from those updates, the index is read-only. and so. Uh, consistency is not as big an issue as it would be in a database system where there are transactions and reads and writes being interleaved. Um, also, if we, if we have a machine fail, uh, if we have a, a disastrous failure of several machines that takes out, say, 1% of our index, the likelihood that uh, the, the top hits for you know, many queries will be from that index is fairly low. So even if there's some downtime part of the index, it's not a big deal. In practice, that doesn't happen. Um, and 
But like I said, we can, the search of the merits can be parallel, so we get linear speed up as we add more machines. And finally, the replication exists at, at, at different levels. So as I said, we have servers that are replicated so that if you're talking to a server and it fails, you can talk to another server which has exactly the same set of data. That's also the case for a server set. So we have the concept of one cluster of machines that can serve, that indexes and serves the entire web. And that is replicated many times so that if uh, you know, a switch goes down, for example, and that cluster goes out, you can switch to a different cluster. Uh, and again, we also have, we have many data inside a single data center, and we have data centers spread over the globe. So if there's an earthquake in California that knocks out power or power outage, we, we can use servers that are elsewhere in the world. So that replication exists at many, many different levels. So here is the, the inside scoop on uh, at least some of the architecture. Uh, so this is the, the Google web server the query comes into. And uh, the first thing it does when a query comes in is to ask the index servers for which documents uh, contain the words that the user is interested in. Um, so there's a, there's a matrix here, and each row uh, is a replica of every other row. Each column is a certain tranche, or what we call shard of the, of the web index. Uh, so the Google Web Server will ask one machine from every shard, that each shard is responsible for some, for some subset of the web, uh, for results from what it knows about. Um, and it can ask any machine in this column. Every machine in this column is a, is a duplicate. So it can ask any of these machines, and it can essentially randomize or round robin its accesses. Or if, uh, or if this machine goes down, it can ask any of the others. Uh, what this means is that as the web grows, we shard more widely. That is, we create smaller chunks and more often. So we have more columns. Uh, as our usage grows, we just add replicas. Uh, and so that allows us to scale up um, arbitrarily, essentially, uh, based on the way the web grows. Of course, over time, uh, machine capacity will also increase. So this acts somewhat to counteract the growth of the, growth of the web, uh, and also the growth of, growth of usage. Once, um, once the Google Web Server gets results back from some set of shards, it will take those results and merge them, and maybe perform some re-ranking to come up with the top 10. Once it has the top 10 results, it goes to the document service. These have entire copies of every page on the web that we've crawled, and uh, it says, here's the query, here's the document I want, give me a snippet, that is a summary of the page that I can show to the user to help them figure out whether this page is relevant. Um, and again, we have it sharded in the same way, uh, except in this case, because we know for each, for each of the 10 requests, we know exactly which shard that document appears in, uh, it does have to make a single access to the appropriate shard here. And again, we have it replicated so that uh, we, can, we can scale up capacity. Uh, on the side also, it talks to things like the spell checker, the ad server, and so on, which operate asynchronously from the main search. Uh, and there are many of these services that sit on the side and respond on a best effort basis. Greg, is the root replicated also? Is the what? The root, the Google Web Server itself. It is, yes, yes, yes. That's a good point. So in fact, this is slightly simpler than it is in practice. It's kind of like a multiplex model of these web servers, and these are, each web server can talk to any of the any of the thing, right? any of the index server and doc servers in a cluster. What's yeah. the quote unquote input request coming into the root number of queries per second for each one? For each one, I think it's each 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 one of these can, can handle in the order of sort of fifty to one hundred queries per second. But it's but it, that's what's really doing. Um, you know, for the, the back end communication yeah, and, and, and so, right? so that, that's essentially Apache, think of Apache. Um, okay, so, so the lessons, I keep, it, keep this all very simple. Uh, you know, we don't have exotic hardware, that means it's also cheap. Uh, and each server has a specific function, and when we have replicas, they are exact replicas. There's no sort of complication about um, deciding who to talk to if, uh, if somebody fails. Keep everything identical. Um, and we try to keep hardware identical as much as possible, but of course, over time, that's not possible. Um, you know, every year, we'll, we'll change the specs, you know, the size of the disk, the amount of memory, the kind of process. So that doesn't include, uh, involve a little more complication because then when you distribute the contents of the web, you need to take account of the capacity of the machines and and chart of So that, that makes things a little more complicated, but it's really unavoidable as, uh, as performance increases. 
Um, expect hardware set failures are designed for them. And uh, the bottom line is this, this cheap hardware allows more computation to query, so we can be smarter. Chris, um, when something fails, yeah. but who gets notified and how long does it take to fix? Okay, that's a very good question. So when things fail, um, the system itself adapts, so, so the immediate consequences are nil, except for maybe some reduction in capacity. Um, but of course we do need to fix this machine eventually. So we have a fairly intricate monitoring system that can sort of a dashboard where the operations people can see at any point in time uh, the health of clusters, the health of individual machines and so on. And so they can identify which machines are unhealthy. Um, and in many cases the machines can self-report what's wrong with it. Um, you can figure out, for example, often we, we on, on a single rack, on a single rack mount uh, uh, board, we'll have two machines. And if suddenly both machines go out, we know it's probably a power supply because they share a power supply. Um, and so that, that's sort of diagnosis of a power supply failure. You know, obviously if, if the disk dies, uh, the machine is still probably capable of responding and saying that, that, that the disk is dead or the error rate has gone too high. We can also monitor things before failure as well. Um, um, errors in memory, uh, and uh, errors like you know, disk errors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can also me measure things like uh, heat on the processor and heat generally. So all of these things get reported and we monitor. At some point, we realize the machine's down, and uh, because we have sort of the leisure of, of um, replacing them, what we do is, is every week, somebody <laughs> comes around with a little power supply cart and they have a list of machines. They kind of roll this thing around these big warehouses and they you know, rip the old power supply out and throw it in power supply in. Somebody else is going around with hard disks and they're ripping them out. And so I'm gonna let you in on a, on a, um, on a company uh, trade secret here. Um, the secret to all this is Velcro. That's all I'm yes. gonna say. There's not many screws involved. Yeah. Do you specifically design for uh, maintainability? Uh, for example, does memory have parity? Yes, memory does have parity. Uh, so this is all ECC memory. Uh, so we can release tell when things are screwed up. But we also, we also, in, in many cases, in the sort of the lower level APIs, we do checksums on memory as well because we don't, we don't always trust what's coming back from memory. We we assume there's some memory coming as well. But yeah, the, there's a trade-off because ECC memory is slightly more expensive. So initially we didn't have ECC memory, um, and we decided that the, the extra expense was actually, was actually worth it. So now we do. Um, it was interesting actually. There was a there was a lot of solar activity about was six months ago. I think there was a big solar flare that was headed towards the Earth, and we actually managed to detect sort of the arrival of the solar flare because over tens of thousands of machines, we could see the the bit error rates going up and, and the reported uh, <laughs> um, So other challenges are keeping the index up to date. Uh, obviously, the, like I said, a lot of the web is, is fairly static. Your home page probably hasn't changed much in the last week. Uh, but there are pages like the front page of CNN that's changed every few minutes. And so uh, making sure that we keep up with those updates is a continuing challenge. Uh, monitoring system state, I mentioned we had a system for monitoring. Um, and we, we essentially build applications so that they export various variables and you can connect on the port and ask about uh, their health and, and, and various throughput measures, all kinds of metrics, uh, failures on the back end and so on. This all gets aggregated in a way that people can identify the, the major problems and get fixed. Um, you do get bit errors when copying terabytes of data, so you have to be, like I said, you have to, you have to think about checksumming data and not trusting what comes back from a disk or, or a RAM. Um, and uh, building machines, we spend a lot of time actually constructing these machines for our specifications. So uh, here's uh, this is a little history lesson. This is uh, google.stanford.edu. Um, it was cobbled together from various pieces of, of equipment that were left over from uh, NSF grants and so on, that Larry and Sergey found. And uh, in the background, you can see here this, this bright colored stuff. This, in fact, if we zoom in, is, is Legos. Um, and these are the disk enclosures. Larry and Sergey found that the cheapest way to, uh, to construct a disk enclosure was out of Legos. <laughs> but but they, they went stuff one step further. They realized that at Costco, they could actually buy uh, imitation Legos, <laughs> which, were, uh, which were actually significantly cheaper than the brand, the brand names. Uh, but it turns out they, have, they don't have as fine a tolerance as, as real Legos. And so every so often, they would have a system crash, where uh, the crash was actually quite literal. Uh, 
you know that every every uh, Silicon Valley startup has to go through a garage at some point in time. You can actually see the garage doors in the background of here. Um, so this is Larry Sergey in the garage of, of Susan Winooski's house with some of the servers around. Um, here is uh, the, the first time we put machines into a data center. This was the design. This was, you can tell that Larry Sergey went hard for engineers. You know, this is like a total disaster. Um, and there's actually a slot missing in here, but you can see otherwise that uh, these things are pretty tightly packed. Um, and if you look very closely, you can actually see that these trays are actually slightly glowing. These are actually um, just aluminum, aluminum trays, unreinforced, um, and uh, you, they're slapped with components on top. Which raises the question, you know, if you slap a motherboard on top of an aluminum tray, there are certain, I don't know if there are any EE people in the audience, but um, <laughs> apparently there are some issues with that. So they, um, they, uh, they solve that with a very simple technique. They lay down a layer of, turns out, turns out the cork is very cheap. Uh, so they lay down a layer of cork and then slap the motherboard on top. Uh, it was kind of a wonder that this never ever burst into flames. I think when they were, when they were wheeling them into the data center for the first time, I'm not sure they were, the, the, the owners of the data center, I think, were worried about their, uh, their fire systems. Anyway, things got a little better later on. This, this is you know, a lot more tidy, obviously, and much more professional design of the, of the racks and so on. You can still see that there are heating issues, though. There's a big fan sort of valiantly blowing up against the, the racks and machines. Um, so here's a data center when it's, uh, before it's, everything's installed, and this is a few days later uh, with all the machines in. Okay, so that's sort of a very high level overview of how we use cheap hardware and make it reliable. How much do you spend on hardware for you? I can't say. <laughs> lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money. We actually, you know, it's, it's our biggest cost by far. Okay, so how do we, how do we get you the, the top 10 results? How do we make sure that they're relevant? We analyze, we do a crawl of the web and then we analyze for each page a bunch of features. Uh, we look at the page and we look at the words on the page. We look at the which words are close to each other. So if you type in a two-word query, um, we'll, we'll favor pages where there's two words appear side by side rather than separated. Uh, we look at the font size. So larger fonts get a higher weight. But of course, you know, the first thing everyone, any spammer does is to make you know, everything the H1. Um, <laughs> So we just take the, you know, the average size and we, we outweigh things that are slightly larger than the average size. Um, and then we also look at link text. So here's another page pointed at this page and the anchor of the anchor text of the link, it says Charles Schwab. And so this gives us an independent um, signal as to what this page is about. Um, and, and, and in some ways, this is more useful than what's on the page because it is somewhat independent. Uh, it's also useful, for example, with lots of the pages and graphics uh, sometimes these are very nice, concise district books. Uh, of course, people use this to try and raise the rank of a page by pointing to it from lots of different places, but we have other ways of detecting that. Um, traditional IR, uh, you take basically the query terms and you look at the number of times those query terms appear on a page, and uh, you rank based on, on that. Um, Classical IR assumes that queries are long and well specified, so a lot of the exper experiments in academia 10 years ago were uh, had very, very long queries like this, sort of the impact of the Balkans War on Anglo Argentinian relations. And um, you know, those queries don't happen very often uh, on the web. Uh, documents also were assumed to be coherent and about one topic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're relatively small, well understood vocabulary. On the web, queries are very short. Uh, pages are often ill-formed, they're often in multiple languages, uh, they're sometimes of very poor quality, uh, and then there's a high incentive for people to misrepresent what their page is about, to attract you to their page uh, based on a query that's not relevant. So it now becomes an adversarial situation. Um, link structure, as I mentioned, the action text tells us what the author, the author of that page thinks of the page that they're pointing to. So it's, it's somewhat independent. Um, and the quality of the referring page allows us to estimate the quality of the target. So for example, if your page on baseball gets linked to by CNN, then that's uh, a big thumbs up. You know, that, that there's some evidence that your page is of, of good quality. Um, and so we look at the links to a page, how many links to the page there are, but also where those links are coming from, the reputation of those sites. 
Um, so your reputation depends on the reputation of people pointing to you. But of course, that's kind of a circular argument because you know, how do we determine the reputation of the pages that are pointing to you? Um, you know, well, it's, that's easy. It's dependent, de determined by the reputation of the people who point to them, etc., etc., etc. But it turns out that uh, you can actually do a reasonable computation. You essentially uh, set uh, set every every page to have the same reputation. Uh, in this case, we, in Google's case, we call this page rank. Um, everybody has the same page rank, and then we take. For example, page A here has four outlets. So we give a quarter of the page rank to each of the pages that A points to. And B has three outlets, so we give a third of the page rank that B has to B. Uh, and we continue this, we also give a, a small amount of um, page rank to every page. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but you can imagine the first time this run is, runs, there's lots of people pointing to CNN. And so P CNN's page rank goes up. Um, and then your page on baseball maybe doesn't have that many pointers to it, so uh, it goes up just a little bit. And then we run this again. Now CNN has this high page rank, and it could contribute some of this large page rank to you if it points to you. Uh, and so we just iterate over this, keep running this very, very simple algorithm, and it eventually converges, uh, and we have a number for each page based on the reputation of the pages pointing to it. So this is page rank computation. Um, Oh, one way to think about this is, is imagine you're a random surfer. You start a random page and you start clicking a random link on every page. Uh, the probability, oh, and one other thing, every so often you, 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 you get a random URL and you just go directly to that URL. I don't know how you know about these URLs that you do. Um, so you know, most of the time you're clicking around, you're clicking on random links, every so often you jump somewhere totally else. Um, so the probability that at any point in time you're on a particular page uh, is, is the page's page rank. So that's another way to think about page rank. Put another way, um, if you surfed for uh, an incredibly long amount of time and then at the end totaled up the number of times you visited the page, that's the page, page, page's page rank. So it's essentially another way of thinking about it is the probability that you'll, you'll get to a particular page um, just based on random surfing. And then finally, sort of mathematical um, uh, idea behind this is that if the web graph you represent as a matrix, that is, we have all the web pages down, uh, the columns, and all, all of them against the rows, then in a particular position, uh, you have a one if there's a, if there's a link from this page to that page, and a zero otherwise. And now if you compute uh, the first eigenvector of that matrix, that eigenvector uh, gives the page rank for every page. But the nice thing is that you can compute the first argument vector by this uh, computation. Okay, so that gives us a number for every page. We haven't talked about queries yet at all. But this helps us with reputation. This says that if, uh, if there are some relevant terms on the front page of CNN, then that is apparently better than exactly the same relevant terms on some no-known page that has a low page rank. So we'll prefer, if the relevance <coughs> is equal, we'll prefer the pages that have a higher page rank. Um, Question before you leave yeah. that. Uh, what do the other eigenvectors mean? So the, the other eigenvectors are, are obviously secondary. They're kind of corrections to the, the proclamation of the first eigenvector means. One thing that you can learn from the second eigenvector, in fact, this is something that Tioma does, which came out of Rutgers, is you can actually learn about clusters of, of pages. So, um, so regularities or patterns in the second eigenvector can tell you that these pages link to each other. They're kind of a tight cluster. Um, and Tioma actually uses that to, uh, to construct communities of similar content. And you can see that, you can see that on the right side of the results. So that's something that Postmos have worked, uh, worked a lot on. Um, so, so the ranking then involves taking this Page this query independent, page specific rank, page rank, and then also looking at the query and looking on the looking at the terms that appear on the page, the font size, the, the words in the, in the links of uh, link to that page, and so on, and then mixing those together somehow. And the somehow is kind of the secret source of Google, which I'm not going to tell you. Just a couple of notes on, on machine learning. So. In, uh, in traditional machine learning, we tend to, to use uh, sophisticated techniques to get 
The slight improvements in learning performance on relatively small amounts of data. So a lot of the test uh, sets of data uh, so they used to be in the UC Irvine data set, you know, relatively small. And you also had, you generally had to do this within the constraints of a single machine. Um, at Google we have, you know, many terabytes of data, so we have enormous amounts of data. Not all of it particularly high quality, but sometimes quantity can, uh, can substitute for quality. I remember as a biochemistry lab at Stanford, there was, there was like this, this slogan on the door of the lab that said, uh, forget quality, go to numbers. But, um, if you have a lot of data, you can actually use that, especially if, you, if it agrees with each other, and it's from independent sources, you can actually do, learn some, some pretty interesting stuff. Um, the other thing that we have at Google, of course, is many, many servers. And not all of these are devoted to, to actually uh, serving the Google service. A lot of them are devoted to research and development, so that you can, for example, uh, if you have an idea, you can easily you know, use you know, a thousand machines simultaneously for, uh, for some distributed task, process the entire web, uh, each machine processing a chunk of that web, and produce some computation. Um, and so there's this whole infrastructure of Google to allow you to do that, which would be kind of, um, which would be much more difficult in an academic machine learning uh, environment. So one of the things we use machine learning for is our spelling corrector, which doesn't have like a, a, a given dictionary. We learn the dictionary from from various places, including uh, what we find on the web and the frequency of spellings and misspellings on the web. Um, it's kind of a testament to human creativity that there are quite so many misspellings of British Is <laughs> 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 that a reflection on the IQ of the people who read I I don't want to comment on that. No. Um, the, the, the fortunate thing is actually the correct spelling is the most common variant, which is kind of the all breathe a sigh of relief for humanity. But, um, but you know, lists and lists and lists. These are on our webpage somewhere, I think, under the job section. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so so I, I've talked about I've talked about scalability and, and uh, doing executing this sufficiently. I've talked about how to how to determine some relevant results. I'm now going to talk about some of the uh, some of the lunar different projects of Google. So, um, why is this out of date? Okay, this is this is slightly out of date. Um, I thought I'd put a new slide in, but if you go to labs.google.com, uh, there's all kinds of new uh, ideas that people are trying out at Google. So, uh, this is very odd because Google Glassware is still on here. Google Glassware is something I did that essentially. Um, finds definitions all over the web and collates them together. Uh, so you get various definitions from different people for a particular word or phrase. And actually, this isn't on labs anymore, it's on the main site. So if you type in, actually, I've got a slide of that later, I'll talk about that more. But anyway, there's lots of fun things on, on Google Apps. You should go to labs.google.com. Um, one of the examples is Google Stats. And what you do here is type in three to five terms that are somehow related, like uh, you know, universities in New Jersey, or in this case, uh, different uh, fashion designers, Armani, Versace, and Prada. And what it goes back to you is more of the same. So in this case, Gucci, Chanel, John Paul Gaultier, Calvin Klein, and so on and so on. Um, and it does this by clustering words that it finds on the web. Is this uh, same as uh, clicking on the similar link? No, it's not. It's totally different. This is word based. Um, so we haven't. You know, again, this is still on labs after like two years, so we haven't really figured out what it could possibly be useful for, but if you haven't got any ideas, you know. Um, another, another service that you're probably more familiar with because it's been on the front page is Google News. So the interesting thing about Google News is that um, it collects stories from all around the world about a particular news story, um, and then clusters them based on the content of their stories. So what you get are clusters of, uh, so here for example, uh, this, this, um, this news item about Palestinian groups uh, is in ABC News, Toronto Star, The Straits Times in Singapore, The Guardian of England, uh, the UK, and so on. So you get these perspectives from reporters from all around the globe, which is something that you probably could do if you were really dedicated and you found <coughs> it, if you knew where these news sources were and you found the same article. But here they are sort of grouped in one location, so you can quickly scan through the different reactions from, from different uh, countries and different societies uh, to a particular event. So in some sense, this is democratizing access to information. Again, it's not information that's not already available, but suddenly this makes it much easier, much more accessible. Uh, Google is something that, that, uh, that I developed and then had a team implement, 
uh, really started off with a research project in information retrieval. Uh, and in particular, if you look at retail pages, there are many, many, there's sort of a standard format for an Amazon books page and a standard format for uh, a Walmart <coughs> page. And there's information on there. Can you actually uh, extract the structured information, things like the price, the image, the category, the name, the description, and so on and so on and so on, and automatically from those pages based on the similarity between pages. Uh, so the answer is yes, and, and the service we implemented using this is Frugal, uh, which is a product search. So again, a specialized search on just the pages on the web that are selling things, and it allows you to you know, see images, uh, sort by price, low to high, and so on and so on and so on. Um, something that we've done in New York, so about a year ago, I moved back to New York and started up the New York engineering office, which was Google's first satellite software development office. And essentially the idea was to attract people who didn't want to move to California. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't, 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 didn't care too much about weather. Um, but, but I think other things are more important than life. Um, so we, we, start, we start out the office and, uh, and managed to hire somebody who was actually a, a, a contest winner. We ran a contest a couple of years ago at Google. Uh, we gave out a big chunk of the web, a big crawl, and said, do something interesting with it. And he came up with a, he essentially recognized locations on pages, translated them to the latitudes and longitudes, and allowed people to search over them. Uh, so when he came to Google, we said, why don't you do the same thing? So he did. Um, and uh, in conjunction with a couple of people in Mountain View and somebody else in New York, came up with a local search, which is still not on the front page, it's still definitely in beta. Uh, but it's actually pretty useful. So think, think yellow pages, but, but only in an, as an analogy. Because what they're doing is looking at web pages and recognizing automatically locations and then clustering those locations based on uh, the names involved and then allowing people to search over them. So you don't just get things that you get on yellow pages, but you also get things described in web pages and also links to descriptions about these things. So if you say, you know, pizza in New York, New York, you get all these web pages that talk about the specific pizza places in addition to a map plotted on there. So again, a form of information extraction and then clustering. Um, again, Google Glossary, and you go to, the, go to Google right now and type in client column and then some phrase or word, and it will give you definitions from around the web. Uh, you know, an apple is a fruit, and it's also a computer. Uh, apparently, it's also a bowling ball. <laughs> it's a nutritious lunchtime dessert, which children will crave for cupcakes. Some of them are you know, kind of more, uh, more humorous. Uh, but again, we're, sort of, we're extracting these from definitions that are out on the web and collating them on the... So we're sort of moving away from just doing things on a per page level, but also uh, understanding more deeply what web pages are talking about. Another thing that we do at Google is the Google Search Appliance, which is, a, which is Google in a box, Google in a bright yellow box. Um, and you can buy this through a corporation or have it in your university and search over your internet. Uh, and you have sort of full control over how often it calls and what it calls. And, on. So it's good for private information uh, and for subsets of data that you want people to have, have access to. Um, Google Web APIs, again, are sort of an experimental thing. Uh, you can access Google with the SOAP XML interface, and so a programmatic interface rather than scraping the HTML, which is, by the way, forbidden by our terms of uh, service. Um, but you can sign up for this and get 10,000 <coughs> queries a day. Um, is it 10,000 or 1,000? 1,000. But you can also I think get that raised, um, and then do queries against Google in an automated way. Uh, right. And again, we haven't figured out how to, what to do with that exactly, so it's still free and we're kind of thinking. Are you going to open that up with Frugal? Uh, will we open that up with Frugal? That's a good question. We haven't really thought about it. There's lots of stuff, other stuff to do with Frugal, yeah. <coughs> One thing we did with Frugal recently is, is put together wml.frugal.com. So you can, when you're in a store, if you have a web capable phone, um, you can actually look up prices for things. And it's a really stripped down, it just gives you the price and the merchant. Uh, and so you can find out if, you know, if the Barnes & Noble here is ripping off, whether well, you should go home and buy it online. There's no reason Barnes & Noble here. Is there also a REST interface to the web here? A what? Uh, REST. No, I don't think so. No, just so. So advertising, we, we also make money at Google, which is a good thing, what we think. Um, and we do that by uh, having people buy ads on the site, which we run across the top and down the side. Again, we just bring back our interface, so this actually looks slightly different today than it did a couple of weeks ago. Um, but a couple of key things about these ads, 
One, we, we clearly mark the things that are ads, the things that get paid for, we say they're sponsored links. And these things here, there's no pay involved in uh, the actual results. There's no bias, nobody can pay to get into Google's results. The advertising um, we is very, very finely targeted. So we look at the query and uh, we think hard about which ads are relevant to that query. So in some cases, the ads are just as helpful as the search results. We, we're trying to make advertising you know, actually useful to customers, which is kind of a novel thought. Um, so instead of you know driving past the billboard on the turnpike, you know where you know thousands of people are driving past, most of which are not interested in buying a car. Or I saw yesterday, you know, one about getting divorced. You know, and, and I don't know what the what the what the fraction of people driving past getting divorced is. But it's, um, you know, but whereas if somebody was typing into Google, they'd be able to you know, be able to target these ads more, uh, much more reasonably. And furthermore, we. The, the advertiser only gets charged when somebody clicks through. So that if, they're, they're, if the ad doesn't get clicked on, uh, then they don't get charged. If people never click on their ads, then the, the ads eventually sink out of sight. So <coughs> the ads position on a page is determined by the combination of the price they're willing to bid and the performance of the ad. Yeah. Is there a reason why all ads are, are text, text only, no graphics? So one thing, so the question was, uh, is there a reason why the text only and no graphics? One thing is that it makes the page load very fast, and people like Google's page to load fast, and in fact, you know, apart from the logo, which totally is cached after you do one search, yeah, everything else on the page is text. So, there's, so, and people on modems obviously appreciate this a lot, and even people on fast connections. And the fact that Google is very fast, I think, is a, is a part of our popularity. The second thing is, though, it's, it's hard to, you know, graphics are more time consuming to put together. So, so individual advertisers, whether they have any sort of graphic expertise or not, can go and type in an ad um, and have it running immediately. Um, and they can type in a dozen ads or 200 ads for very specific things. And we want to encourage people to advertise on very specific things so that um, you know, we can match them to very specific queries and have a high probability that, that the users that, that is presented with that ad uh, actually get something relevant. Um, if we come up with an automated way of generating graphical ads, um, and we and we had only certain maybe people broadband users, maybe there's an argument for graphical ads. But does that answer your question? So we rank them by by the, the product of the click-through rate and the cost per click. So if you bid, you say I'm willing to pay 25 cents for somebody to click on that ad, and somebody else is only willing to pay 20 cents, then you'll be higher on the on the list of ads, and you'll get more clicks. How come it works? Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, the click-through rate on this ad is lower, and we multiply the click-through rate and the cost per click together. And the effect that this has is over time, as we see the click-through rates, if your ad isn't very relevant, it's probably going to be the case that people aren't going to click on it very much. And so it will kind of sink down to the more relevant ads will float to the top. So this, this is another effect that helps keep the ads relevant. And at some point, if the click-through rate falls below, I think it's currently 1%, then we take your ad off entirely. We stop running your ad and we say, come back, try and reword your ad, choose a different set of keywords that will appear on, and then we'll you know, run it again and we'll see how it goes. Because we don't want ads showing up that nobody clicks on that are a waste of space. How do you keep it from being a self fulfilling uh, prophecy? Good question. Right, so as you, as you raise these things up on the rankings, obviously you're going to get more click through just because they're in a more prominent position. It's a very good question. So we actually normalize by, we know the rate at which people click on the first, second, third, you know, independent of the ad, so we can normalize by that click-through rate. So we essentially normalize the click-through rate as if they would be in the first position, and then, and then use this calculation. Um, incidentally, if you multiply the cost per click times click-through rate, which is the probability of click, that also corresponds to our revenue. So that's enough. <laughs> But we did it for good reasons, really. Coming back to the page, is that interest uh, a thing calculated by you, the Google or it's? It is, it is. And I'm not sure whether we show that anymore, uh, because nobody really looked at it. Um, it's, it's basically the relevance, what we think is the relevance of the query to the, to the, uh, to the, to the ad. Because somebody, if you say, um, you know, travel to Bali, then this might be somebody says, I want to advertise on any query with the word travel. So, where somebody else might say, I want to advertise on any query with travel and Bali. So that, that second ad is actually much more relevant. So we'll say, this is a high probability of being relevant. So people have wanted, so I think we dropped it in the reason. Um, 
So click through is the number of clicks on the hand, right? Yeah. So the initial click through rate is zero. That's right. That's that's also a good observation. So the initial click through rate is zero. So we essentially give people a thousand. <laughs> We, we initially put, give people a thousand clicks for free. Well, not for free, but before we start throttling them back or switching them off or whatever, we give them a thousand clicks. That gives us some hope of, of detecting what that click through rate actually is, and then that's right. That's a good point. Um, so, it's, challenges are you know, ads must be served quickly and very reliably, and uh, we also show ads on other people's sites, and they don't tolerate any downtime. So, even though Google itself is very reliable, the ad system is, is much more critical. So there's a different engineering challenge. And you don't want to bill people for uh, ads that can get clicked on. You don't want ads to get clicked on and not billed for them. So the, the interlocking of data is much more, more complicated. And so uh, we don't have this kind of, because there's click data feeding back in the opposite direction, this is suddenly a rewrite problem. And you have a database and there's consistency and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't make the, we actually spend a little bit more on machines. So, just because uh, we can't we can't play quite so fast to use with that stuff. Um, one thing we've been doing recently, over the past year and a half, we've been showing ads, or two, two or more years I guess, we've been showing ads just on search results. So then somebody thought, well why, why can't we show them on web pages? And the problem with web pages is that you know we've got these ads and we know the keywords are relevant, but there's no keywords on a page, there's a lot of text. So what we do is we have a technique for analyzing uh, text on the page, trying to figure out what the page is about in total, kind of the overall top of the page. So this is kind of a natural language processing AI problem. Uh, and we use that sort of topic, the overall topic, to determine which ads to show. So for example, here there's the page about work and career, et cetera, et cetera. And here's some ads from Google that say career development plan or free career plan. Um, so, that, that's, a, that's a whole new area for Google showing ads on actual pages. And you might have seen them on, on various websites around the web. Uh, and I'll say ads by Google there. Yeah. Uh, do you pay the individual websites yes. for hosting? Yes. Ads? So if you, have a, if you have a website that, that gets a reasonable number of visitors, then you can sign up for this, for this program. And every time somebody, when we will serve ads on your page, uh, you just have to put in a little iframe and some JavaScript. Uh, we'll crawl your page, figure out which ads are relevant, and show those relevant ads. Whenever somebody clicks on an ad on your page, you'll get some of the money and we'll get some of the money. Okay, I think you'll get most of the money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a good deal. Like, so there was a story recently about uh, the AdSense being exploited by uh, people who generate this click through making people right. pay. So right. What was the technical Right, right. I mean, we want to make sure that, that clicks on the ads are real people, not somebody setting up a little robot to click on ads to get themselves money. So we have a team of four people who, who look at the clicks on and, and detect bots, basically. Um, so that's that's kind of the issue, and that you know we have a pretty strong core team. Uh, uh, I don't read websites, I just syndicate the money planning to uh, RSS uh, or Apple applications uh, for ads as well. So the question is about RSS or you know, Adam, uh, aggregation. That's that's an interesting idea. We we sort of talked about that internally, but we're, you know, we don't have any interview with that. Is there a question? Um, <coughs> yeah. uh, right, so here are some of the keywords and here are, here are some of the ads we've mentioned too. Um, another question is, you know, if you just see the word Java, you don't know whether we're talking about an island or a programming language or a drink. Uh, but if you look at, you know, the word things like cup and coffee and so on, you can use all those together to infer that this is the right cluster and therefore show ads for drinks. Uh, that, what do marketing people say? Does it depend on the person who is reading or the contents of the No, the content of the page. I mean, suppose there is a, uh, an article that says drinking a cup of coffee kills you. What's the point in showing an ad on coffee? <laughs> Every so often, our algorithm, you know, shows ads to the left that are less than optimal. I think there was some woman who, who killed her husband and put him in a trunk, and we showed ads for, or no, put, put him in a suitcase, and so we showed sure ads for luggage. <laughs> I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> so you know, we're not, it's not, it's not perfect. <laughs> we, we, at Google, the thing is that there's no editorial judgments made in, in, in any of our processes, so we can always say the old ones did. <laughs> But this many people click on the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and who were those people? <laughs> um, okay, so that's the technical stuff. Um, we, we see we see some interesting behaviour on Google. So uh, about a year ago, uh, back when Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was a popular TV program, um, we had um, there was a question, a million dollar question. And uh, the contestant was asked, what is Carol Brady's maiden name? So he had, still had one lifeline left, which was he was able to call a friend. So he calls up his friend and says, uh, print your Google search for Carol Brady's maiden name. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the guy comes, fumbles around, comes back with the answer, and he says, that doesn't sound right. You know. I'm going to pass. So he passes anyway. The guy, I think he had the right answer, but he, you know, he didn't want to, he wanted the half a million dollars and wasn't willing to risk it. Um, but somebody, some Google engineer was, was watching this and thought, that's interesting. Let's go and look at the, the logs, um, you know, the, the queries that came in around that time. And so it turns out that at just before 6 uh, Pacific time, which is just before 9 Eastern, so when the show was, you know, the, the end of the show, there's a huge spike in the query, you know, Carol Brady, <laughs> it sort of falls off. Then you can see a sort of a little peak where a few affiliates in Mount, uh, Central Time showed it, and then Mountain Time, and then you know showed it in, uh, in California. And then a few hours later, there's like this oh, light. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, there's, there's, there's sort of interesting data in there. If you do what look for. <laughs> Incidentally, we take we take the privacy of these queries very very seriously. You know, we can't identify individual users, um, and. You know, we, we don't allow anybody who to try and identify anything <coughs> with a very strict privacy uh, guidelines from Google on that. Um, we do do things like summarize queries. So uh, this is uh, now quite a few months old, but uh, the, the gaining queries in September uh, were announced. So the report had just come out about the Columbia tragedy. Um, and then uh, the US Open was happening. Pat Mars was very, very close, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Star Wars Kid story was pretty much over. People were stopping querying the Star Wars Kid. And if you don't know what that means, you have to go Google it. Um, and etc. You know, cricket. I guess there's been some cricket thing that was getting this popular. The Kona fires and PC were running out and so on. Um, in July 2003, there were lots of searches for Tour de France, but not so many for Wimbledon. So, so I have no idea about popularity of different uh, events worldwide. Um, in Japan, I mean, Google is very international, so we have a lot of, and the majority of our traffic comes from outside the U.S. And here are some popular queries in Japan. Uh, the Tanabata, Tanabata Starter Festival was popular in July 2003. Um, the cheesecake recipe, for some reason. <laughs> 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 um, and then uh, popular movies, including Terminator 3 and a, and a movie called uh, Cutie Honey, <laughs> which I don't think ran here. Um, <laughs> Over time, you can see various different browsers and, and languages access in Google. So, for example, uh, over time, uh, this is over 2001, 2, and 3, Internet Explorer 6 was gaining in popularity, uh, beating down the other browsers, mainly Internet Explorer 5.5 and 5.0. And, and uh, you know, the browsers we all care about are sort of down here. <laughs> um, over time, also, Google is getting more international. So fewer and fewer queries as a percentage at least in English, and more and more queries in other languages like German and Japanese and, and so on. Um, and consider that a lot of the web is in English, so even people for whom English is not their first language might query in English just uh, to find that content. So clearly that the, um, the, uh, the demographic of Google is very, very international. Um, and finally, we can look at patterns during the day. So um, in the US, there's sort of a, a low point here at about 3 in the morning, and at noon, it sort of peaks, and then, and then in the evening, it levels off a little bit before going down. Uh, we see this odd behavior in places like France and Spain, where kind of in the middle of the day, there's this odd dip. <laughs> 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 so okay, so any questions? Yeah. Um, what would you say the major improvement in Google in the last two years in terms of technology? 
So, the biggest, the well, question, what's the biggest improvement in Google over the last couple of years? Um, so, so to some extent, um, I think I think the biggest improvement has been auxiliary services like news, for example. Um, one thing we've done much better <coughs> better on is freshness in Google in general, having having crawling pages as, almost as soon as they change, and therefore having the latest data. And a, and a very extreme example of that is news. So we now call on a very regular basis 4,500 different news sources, and those are available in Google News. But we also uh, have them appear above the search results when there are sort of news items that are relevant to your search, even on the front page of Google. Um, so the combination of news and other things where freshness is very important. And also coverage has in, increased as well. So we've gone from uh, you know a couple of years ago having a couple of billion pages in our index to now having four billion pages in the index. So coverage and freshness I think are the two keys. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of talk about this. Uh, Machines serve the queries from the users. How about those machines and software and do, I mean, go out and get the data? And, uh, <coughs> no, I mean, because there are no comments to cover that. What kind of machines, software, and Sorry, I'm not sure. I'm say that again. OK, so I mean, your talk. Uh, we introduced hardware in software and the founders. Right. It's more about how to build a system so the I mean the live parameters can be used. Right. There's another part in the system that can be used without throughout all the pages right. in that. I see. Yeah. Right. So so the question is about the crawling system, right. about fetching pages. So and and specifically I mean the, the, the requirements for that are obviously very different because it's, it's more asynchronous. You have time to you know retry a page uh the first time and so on. Um, exactly the same kind of machines. And the same idea is still, I mean, you still have uh, a distributed system with many, many uh, machines that can perform the same job and fail over and so on, because you still have the same problem as failure. Uh, but, each, but there, the, it's even more lax, because you, know, you don't have to be real time about it. Uh, 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 do you use any human resources at all for hiring or augmenting it? No, there's, there's, there's no humans involved at all in, in, in organizing the core. Don't you think it's useful because so many people are visiting your web page and clicking on things? That's a good question. We sort of we we think about it a lot. Um, but so so the question, you know, one thing you could do is to optimize kind of the most popular queries. Um, but it turns out even the most popular queries don't so don't constitute a huge fraction of, of the queries that we get. Uh, so there's a very long, long, long tail, um, which means that you spend a lot of effort on just those few. And so, that, so that's one issue. Um, the second issue, though, is a is a philosophical one. We want we want to have if we if, if there's a better set of results for a, a query, say, uh, and somebody points this out or we notice it, we would like to think of an algorithmic way of doing better. Uh, and by fixing the algorithmic problem, we then probably fix another you know thousand queries. Um, and sort of hand tuning a bunch of results would tend to kind of hide that problem and, and not force us to confront sort of issues with our ranking algorithm. Um, and I guess the third thing is that it's nice to be able to say that there's no editorial involvement in our results. Um, so, that, so that in some cases, if, if some results are not optimal or people have kind of political disagreements or religious disagreements with our results, we'll say, it's an algorithm. Um, you know, and I was being a little facetious before blaming the algorithm, but, but there's some truth to being able to say, you know, there's, there's maybe no right answer for this particular query. Um, so, you know, we don't have any humans involved. This is not a political bias or religious bias in front of Google. This is, this is you know, competition. Yes? Um, are you considering a content that's not so easy to search, like Flash movies? Yeah, so, so we do actually index text and, and Flash movies. We actually have a little program that will crawl them and then figure out the text and that. But, but you're right, there's lots of things on the web that have sort of embedded text or embedded things in various descriptions and, you know, we're sort of slowly working on, you know, the more common variants of those. So, um, what, was your, what would be your opinion of, especially for the students here, what are the interesting technical challenges or areas that students could, and research groups here could work on, uh, right. that you would think are longer than <coughs> Problems. So, so I guess the big research challenges for us are kind of you know the, the two I presented. First is distributed systems. How do you 
How do you use effectively a large quantity of computing resources, especially when it's unreliable? Um, um, I, I sort of, it's, it's interesting this question of, of, of doing research on these issues. Um, um, I'm, I'm kind of, so, so the, other, the other thing I guess is, is machine learning and how do you take uh, textual information and queries and figure out what the textuation, textual information means and matching it to queries and what people are already asking. But in some ways both of those, um, both of those issues are harder to attack when you don't have a, a large infrastructure to experiment on. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something slightly pessimistic from, a, from an academic point of view is that, uh, is that you know, these things become much more interesting when you really do have tens of thousands of machines and all of the web you know, and a stream of queries coming in. Um, the proposal that I've kind of, sort of been mulling over and, and suggested really often is that computer science research needs kind of like a cyclo cyc cyclotron. You know, physicists have this huge shared resource. You know, they wouldn't be able to, any single institution wouldn't be able to build a cyclotron, uh, but cyclotrons are necessary to do sort of, you know, investigations into the subatomic particles. Um, you know, imagine if computer science had the, the equivalent of a cyclotron, where there was some shared resource with, that had tens of thousands of machines that had a, a, had a dedicated staff, just as the cyclotron does, to keep crawling the web and uh, you know keep services running, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, then I think you know there would be much more. You'd be able to do much more interesting analysis. And I guess Planet, Planet Lab is kind of some version of that, where it's kind of a shared resource, um, but it needs to be kind of a couple of that orders of magnitude bigger. Uh, to be, and, and also to be professionally managed. I mean, you need to actually have staff devoted to making sure that things are reliable and useful. Uh, and also coming up, also working on the, the software infrastructure to use the systems, so so monitoring and uh, machines for you know, systems for distribution and so on. Um, but but anyway, to answer your main question, I think the different systems and and the kind of the AI, the AI task and a question answer. With respect to systems, is limited computing and economic computing just not reliable to research between utility computing and economic computing? So the question is about economic computing and utility computing. To be honest, I don't know a lot about those areas. But uh, to, to be honest, I don't know a lot about those areas. But we, we, we tend to do a lot of you know rolling our own within Google. So. You know, we're our own service providers, so I'm not sure whether that has any particular implications for, say, utility computing. Um, but we also have lots of sort of ideas, at least, about self-healing, uh, you know, and this whole system, you know, taking care of itself and being resistant to failure and so on. Um, and I'm not, I'm not totally sure how easy those are to generalize that broader situation. We have fairly specific kind of constraints, and, and some, you know, in some ways we're less constrained than the than applications. We should. Uh, yeah, can I ask uh, yeah. another question, which is, uh, do you want, how long do you want to keep taking questions? Uh, I'm happy to take questions as long as I hang around. So, uh, <coughs> but but also I don't want to keep people here if, if you need to leave for other things. So why don't we say at this point, leave well, if you want to, and, and others who can stay. Okay.